Uh, so I'll be talking about um, how tracker and aggregate data can be linked in DTRIS2, uh, some different approaches. Um, uh, and I'll start with sort of general introduction to different ways, different approaches uh, of integrating tracker and aggregate data in DTRIS. Uh, sort of a bit broadly, and then focus more on specifically how uh, data can be moved from being tracker data into an aggregate system. So actually exporting data from tracker and saving it as aggregate data values. Uh, and in particular, different considerations uh, you need to um, have uh, when doing this. Um, then uh, we have Eric from Hispiganda who will be talking about um, how they have um, approached this issue of linking tracker and aggregate uh, in their TB leprosy uh, tracker implementation. Uh, so we'll get that uh, use case uh, presented. And um, towards the end, we'll see if we have time for some questions. Uh, if not, we'll follow up in the Slack channel. Uh, so to begin, um, I'll go through a few different ways in which uh, you can link tracker and aggregate data in DHS. And I think um, uh, sorry. Um, that when we talk of aggregate data, in DHS, uh, we often assume that's the HMIS, that it's the aggregate reporting system as such. But I think uh, in this context, we have to think of um, aggregate data also as being uh, a function of DHS2, the aggregate data model, which you can use even if you don't have an HMIS reporting system, even if um, you're not actually entering aggregate data. Uh, so it's sort of a separation between aggregate data as such in DHIS2 and having an aggregate HMIS reporting system. Um, so I'll, I'll be going through uh, three different approaches uh, uh, for linking these two uh, types of data in DHIS2. Um, briefly before focusing on the third one. So the first one is uh, perhaps a bit obvious, but in DHIS2, uh, you have the possibility of opening the um, analysis tools and making charts that actually combine aggregate data elements, aggregate indicators with tracker, uh, tracker data. So whether it's uh, using the data visualizer or um, and combining different types of indicators there in one uh, table or chart, or if it's using the different uh, event reports, event chart apps uh, for producing outputs with aggregate data and combining them with, um, sorry, tracker data and combining them with aggregate data in a dashboard. Those are just two examples. Uh, so on the slide here, um, the example on the right, which is, um, from our demo database, so it's not real data, but showing how um, the first three row, rows is aggregate data coming from routine reporting of um, COVID vaccinations. And then we have uh, adverse events following immunization data coming from tracker combined in one uh, report. So that's one example. Uh, the other example, at the bottom shows how you could have, for example, a uh, line listing with anonymous data. In this case, uh, cause of death uh, data in a dashboard next to aggregated data. So that's one approach. Um, the advantage here is that it's easy to set up. You just use the analysis tools. Um, it works well if you have data from tracker and aggregate that are sort of complementary and it makes sense to bring them up together. And you have the possibility of including uh, sort of any level of granularity you want from the tracker side. 
but the disadvantage here is uh, one that um, due to the way the data in DHIS is structured, uh, the way that sort of dimensionality in the data is handled in aggregate, for example, with H and sex disaggregations, is not compatible with the way that works in Tracker. So you wouldn't be able to have one table combining program indicators and aggregate indicators with the H disaggregation as a separate dimension, for example. So there are limitations to what you can do. Um, and of course, a big uh, assumption here is that you have the same data in the same database. Um, and as Marcus talked about uh, this morning, that's not uh, always the case, not always recommended. Uh, a second way of combining tracker and aggregate data is through aggregate indicators. So in the aggregate side of DHIS, uh, the aggregate indicators, which you define essentially setting up a calculation of a numerator and denominator, as is illustrated on the right there, those can draw in data both from the aggregate side and the tracker side. So you could have, for example, um, a case where you have immunization registry in tracker, where you can get the count of children given a BCG dose in this example on the slide. And then you can pull in your population denominators uh, from the aggregate side as one example. You can also do this to add up service data. Say, for example, you have um, a certain type of facilities using Tracker for maternal health, uh, and you have other types of facilities reporting uh, aggregate. If this is in the same DHIS2 instance, you can add those two numbers up. So we have ANC first visits coming from Tracker in some facilities, ANC first visits coming from uh, aggregate in other facilities, adding up to total number of ANC first visits. So in some scenarios, this may be useful um, to add up sort of complementary data. Uh, again, this is relatively easy to set up within DHIS2 using the built-in functionality. It can help potentially hide some of the complexity um, to the end user since they get an aggregate indicator which gives them the total they want without having to look for data in different data sources. But some of the same disadvantages apply here as for the first approach. Uh, there are limitations again on disaggregations, having separate data dimensions for things like age uh, breakdowns and sex. It can be difficult to manage if you're using this to add up service data. You need to be very sure that you don't have any overlaps. So you have same facility reporting through tracker and aggregate, then you will get um, then you will be double counting. So you need to be very careful uh, if you're doing this uh, in that way. And again, it requires that the tracker and aggregate data is in the same DHIS2 instance. So in one of the example indicators with the BCG coverage, uh, that may be as simple as um, having some aggregate denominators in your tracker instance. But in other cases, it may be more uh, complex. And then the last approach, which is probably what many think of when they think of um, linking tracker and aggregate data values, is to actually take the tracker data uh, and aggregate it and save it as aggregate data values. Um, so that this way, you can use the tracker data to feed into the aggregate reporting system, the HMIS. And there are different ways of doing this. It can be done sort of ad hoc uh, on a needs basis. We need to do uh, you need to do some particular analysis, or you can set it up as an automated process for every week, every month. You take your tracker data. Um, and you save it as aggregate data values. <clears throat> so what is a bit different with this approach is that uh, not all the functionality is bu built into DHIS2 itself. So you need somehow to use tools outside of DHIS2 to, do, to achieve this. Um, 
So whether that's manually querying the DHIS2 API to get the data out and importing it again, uh, there are several applications in the DHIS2 community which helps uh, you do parts of this uh, data transfer. It's also possible to set up the predictors um, functionality of DHIS2, uh, but there are some issues there with uh, the periodicity, etc. Uh, so doing this is sort of two main use cases. One is, uh, as you see here, you have your tracker data. You want to use that to populate um, aggregate reporting form. So you want to automate your HMIS reporting. The other main use case is that you want to leverage some of the analysis functionality of DHIS2, which is applicable to aggregate data, but not to tracker data. So again, and coming back to this uh, example of the dimensionality, you see on the left here, you have a list of new relapsed TB cases uh, with H and uh, sex disaggregations. These are program indicators coming from a TB tracker. Uh, but it's just a long list. Uh, of figures. If you want to be able to produce a chart like the one on the right, where you have uh, different series for the sex, where you have different categories in the chart for the H disaggregations, uh, and you have the possibility to sort of pivot this around, then you would have to turn those program indicators into aggregate data values first. Uh, so to summarize the advantages here, uh, as I said, you have the possibility of analyzing data with additional dimensionality. You can um, use it to uh, automate some of the aggregate reporting. Uh, but in addition to this, there are also uh, less sort of obvious uh, advantages. One is that it can help uh, with the performance. Um, so there's been some examples now that uh, in large tracker uh, systems, some of the program indicators are very heavy for the server to process. Uh, so in particular cases where you sort of, you're adding cumulatively uh, lots of tracked entities. Um, so one example is you want to know the number of HIV patients uh, currently on treatment, you need to then make a query of all patients that's in the database. Um, or if you have, um, if you want to look at uh, people vaccinated and you need to look at all tracked entities up to the current date to look at how many has been vaccinated, uh, the next day you need to look at all those same figures as well as the ones uh, added uh, in the last 24 hours. So this can be very taxing on the server to make these queries. Uh, but if you're able to save some of these values as aggregate data values so that you don't have to redo the calculation uh, every time you query the program indicator, uh, it can essentially reduce the load on the server. Uh, and this approach is also helpful if you have sort of a hybrid or gradual implementation of tracker, which is often the case that you have, for example, you roll out tracker in region by region. Uh, so most of the country is using uh, aggregate reporting and then parts of the country is still uh, has introduced tracker. You want to have all that information in one place. Uh, then being able to take your tracker data from the regions using tracker and uh, aggregating it up so that it becomes um, sort of compatible with what the rest of the country is doing is very useful. Of course, there are disadvantages. Uh, compared to the other approaches, this is more complicated to um, configure and maintain. As I mentioned, you need to have some sort of tool or script outside of DHIS2 to actually do the extraction and import of the tracker data. 
you need to have a mapping between your tracker and your aggregate uh, variables that needs to be maintained every time there is a change. And as soon as you have two separate instances of DHIS2, uh, you need to make sure that the same organization units are uh, present in both. So you suddenly introduce potentially a whole issue of uh, having a master facility list or synchronizing your organization units. So I think you need to keep in mind here that these approaches uh, could be seen as complementary, <clears throat> and you might have to use uh, several of them for different uh, programs or different purposes, maybe at different stages in the implementation, uh, and to sort of address the information needs of different types of users. Uh, it is also important to keep in mind here uh, how DHIS2 is actually deployed in particular when you have both tracker and aggregate instances. Uh, so we're coming back to um, what Marcus was talking about uh, this morning. You may have, within the country, you may have, uh, perhaps you only have tracker, you don't have any aggregate instances. So you have tracker only as on the left. You may have, uh, tracker and aggregate reporting systems combined in one DHIS2 instance, or you may have um, separate instances for tracker and aggregate. And in all of these scenarios, there may be need, uh, a need for linking tracker and aggregate uh, data in different ways. So if you have a, an instance with only tracker data and you don't have any or parallel aggregate systems, uh, you may still want to uh, link in aggregate data um, into that tracker instance, whether it's to get the uh, targets for planning, whether it's to get denominators to be able to calculate coverage indicators, whether it's generating aggregate data in order to uh, do additional analysis, you can only do in aggregate or for efficiency reasons. As I mentioned, that aggregate data analytics is in some cases more efficient, less taxing on the server. If you have a combined tracker and aggregate system, uh, many of the same uh, reasons for combining the two applies here. Um, but this, of course, gives you more possibilities of integrating the two data sources in a single database. And it lets you, then it becomes relevant to look into automating HMIS reporting uh, to replace manual aggregation of uh, individual level data. And again, much of the same applies if uh, you have separate tracker and aggregate systems. Uh, in this case, actually moving um, data from tracker into aggregate may also uh, be necessary if you want to do sort of cross-program analytics. So that's another sort of separate issue here. You may have a tracker instance where you have um, perhaps TB case reporting. Then you have all your HIV data is being reported um, via aggregate uh, monthly forms. And if you want to look at TB and HIV together, you need to bring the TB data into the aggregate instance uh, to be able to do that kind of cross-program analytics. Uh, so this is an attempt to sort of summarize, depending on how your tracker and your aggregate systems are um, set up, which of the approaches are um, feasible? What does it take? So if you have an instance with only tracker, to be able to show tracker and aggregate together in dashboards, to be able to use um, combined data and aggregate indicators, you need to somehow get aggregate data into tracker first. So it's not uh, out of the box. Um, it may still be relevant to use the third approach of actually creating aggregate data from your tracker data to be able to do analysis, to improve uh, performance. 
if you have everything combined in one instance, then all of these approaches are sort of uh, potentially useful out of the box. If you have separate aggregate and tracker instances, the same applies to if you, as if you have only tracker, you need to somehow um, get your aggregate data into the tracker instance if you want to use the combined aggregate indicators or if you want to show uh, tracker and aggregate data together in um, charts and dashboards. So I think uh, after this introduction, we'll do a short uh, Mentimeter. If uh, Alice can help with the uh, part one. Sorry, yes. Um, let me share my screen. Next question. Oh, what happened? Sorry. Um, next, next question. How will this So we'll focus now on this third approach and looking at uh, both how this is done and also some of the things you need to consider when you're doing this. Um, so this is now in many ways the use case we're focusing on the most, having your aggregate data, turning it into uh, an aggregate data value, uh, which in many cases will uh, feed into the HMIS reporting, but not always. So in terms of, I won't go into the full technical details on this, but just um, uh, showing a bit on the process uh, of doing this technically. So there are alternatives to this. Uh, using different kinds of apps and middleware to uh, transform the data, uh, perhaps uh, do the mapping between tracker and aggregate outside of DHIS2. Uh, what I'm uh, sort of showing the conceptualization of here is using uh, built-in features of DHIS2 as much as possible. Uh, and using the API endpoints of DHIS2 to sort of export directly program indicator values as aggregate data values. Uh, so that as much as possible, all this process happens inside of DHIS2. Uh, so here we have our uh, tracker data stored in DHIS. Uh, to get this data transformed into aggregate data, we define program indicators, for example, program indicators that count um, how many children were en enrolled in the immunization registry program that had a uh, dose of BCG and were zero to 11 months, for example. So this defines, based on the tracker data, the aggregate outputs that we want. We can then query DHIS2, the DHIS2 API, for this data, we specify what periods do we want. Do we want this monthly? Do we want it weekly? Do we want it quarterly? And for what organization units? And then DHIS2 will give us what is called a data value set, which is uh, a format typically a JSON or XML file with the actual data values, aggregate data values exported from program indicators. This format is what DHIS2 uses when importing aggregate data values. So once we have this data exported from the program indicators, we can import it again into DHIS as aggregate data. Uh, and this could be in the same DHIS2 instance or a different DHIS2 instance. Doesn't matter, but uh, the big but here is that you need to have a way of identifying both the data. So there needs to be a code on the program indicators and the data element so that you have a way of mapping them. 
as well as the organization units. Uh, so uh, the key components in this tracker to aggregate data migration are the program indicators that define define the aggregate values that you want out. It's the aggregate data elements, uh, which is the target where you want to save your aggregate data values. And the API that allows this data to be exported and imported. Um, and all of this data needs to have uh, codes or identifiers so that they can be mapped to each other. Uh, and of course, this means that if, as part of your implementation, you want to be able to um, use tracker data for aggregate reporting, you need to make sure that the way that you set up your tracker program makes it possible to generate these aggregate data values, which I think is uh, something also uh, Brian touched upon in the previous presentation, that you need to make sure that you align what you can get out of your tracker program with the outputs you need to do aggregate reporting. Uh, I see I will speed up a bit now to make sure that uh, we have time for Eric as well. <clears throat> there are a few different uh, alternatives when you actually do this extraction of tracker data and import of aggregate data. If you have only one instance, then of course you would do the move the data within that instance. Uh, in cases where you have separate tracker and aggregate instances, there are essentially two options. You could either extract your data from the tracker instance and import it directly into the aggregate instance, or you could first um, export and import the data in the tracker instance, meaning that you actually have your aggregate data values in the tracker instance as well. Uh, and then move the aggregate values from your tracker instance to your aggregate instance. So you're doing this in a two, uh, as a two-step process. There are some advantages to this. Uh, in particular, that this means that any users you have in the tracker instance will be able to use this um, these aggregate values with the benefits uh, of the analysis uh, tools for tracker. It makes the actual first part of the process of generating the aggregate data a bit easier since you don't have to worry about organization units not being the same in the two instances. The downside being that you introduce a second step uh, where you do have to take organization units into account. Uh, so this is a very, having this as a separate slide, just to emphasize how important this is. Uh, in some implementations where the number of organization units is not too big and the changes aren't that frequent. Uh, I think it's doable to manage this um, more or less manually to have procedures for making sure that if you add the facility in one instance, it's also added to the other. And if there is uh, an issue when you're moving data, you get the notification. But if you have tens of thousands of facilities, you need some sort of uh, interoperability uh, setup that helps you manage organization units across instances. Uh, so I'll uh, finally look at some of the things you need to consider uh, if you're doing this uh, data integration. So. I think there are lots of things here you need to make a decision on, think through how you want to do, but there's not necessarily a correct answer. So what I'm doing here is for the most part, outlining all the different things you need to consider in order to uh, link the aggregate and tracker uh, systems. Uh, yeah, so this is just re-emphasizing uh, this point that 
uh, you may want to produce tracker data both to be able to automate your HMIS reporting, but also uh, to be able to do additional analysis. Um, in terms of actually migrating the data, examples of things you need to consider is how often do you actually want to do this? Should this be done every day? Should it be done at the end of every reporting period? Uh, should you then, when you're migrating data, do you do that for the last six months to make sure that any previous data uh, that has been updated on the tracker side is always up to date in the aggregate side? Uh, how do you align this transfer process with uh, procedures in HMIS? For example, in many countries, uh, aggregate data is verified and then locked after a certain period of time. What if your tracker uh, system, if data capture is retroactive, what if it doesn't meet those deadlines? How do you, um, how do you deal with that? So that's sort of one set of questions you need to uh, ask yourselves. Uh, somewhat related, how do you deal with errors in the data? Uh, if you have data that's already been migrated and then someone does corrections on the tracker side, uh, how do you expect that to make it into the aggregate? Um, what if you identify data quality issues in your aggregate data? How do you go back and deal with that? Or do you correct them, adjust them separately? How do you deal with completeness and timeliness of reporting, which is key data quality metrics in HMIS, but isn't really a concept in the tracker side where you're dealing with individuals? Uh, how do you ensure that users have access to the data they need? and no access to the data they shouldn't have access to. If you have separate instances, how do you make sure that uh, users have access uh, to both? Um, who are the owners of the data coming from Tracker submitted to HMIS? Perhaps the Tracker data is only a subset of a, an aggregate form. And who is responsible for what is being reported? Uh, so there are a number of issues related to access and ownership. And uh, finally, related to uh, sort of quality and ownership, you will often need to have some sort of transition period uh, where you're doing parallel reporting, comparing the numbers, uh, looking at sort of discrepancies, because I think the chances that you will have identical numbers coming from your tracker and uh, manually aggregated figures is uh, very low, but then you need to discuss why are they different? Where does the source of the problem uh, lay? And then you use that information to decide when it's time to uh, stop with the parallel reporting. Yes, uh, finally, as I've mentioned, some of this needs to be managed outside of DHIS2. So as you're planning an implementation, if you want to do this, you need to also take, consider that you need uh, people who can manage these things, who can set up the integration or the migration and maintain these over time. Uh, in the, these metadata packages, which have been presented previously, some of these mappings between tracker and aggregate are included in the packages. So you still need to develop the actual solution for moving data, but the mapping between the tracker uh, side and the aggregate side is included in these uh, metadata packages. I'll skip the second mentee for now because I see we don't have time and leave the word to Eric to present uh, real world case from Uganda. All right. Um, I think it's good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's good to be on the call. My name is Eric Nyambabazi. I work with uh, HISP Uganda and I support project implementation uh, as well as BHIS2 implementation. 
I will share with you this uh, use case for uh, um, an instance called the Nas uh, National TB and Leprosy Electronic Case-Based Surveillance uh, System, um, which, from which, of course, we uh, we have been implementing um, the, the project for about close to a year now. And uh, we have gone through a couple of experiences and, and we'll be sharing those. Um, and basically from this presentation, we'll focus on the linking uh, aspect, which is what Olav has been sharing. Um, and we'll just skip through a, a couple of, of other things. Um, I wanted to quickly give um, sort of a background, a quick background on, on where the project started, objectives, the approach, the models, uh, and then we can lastly discuss a bit on the, the linkages. But I was also thinking uh, we could maybe take a look at some of the, of the, of, 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 of the system screenshots that, that we, we were using. Um, so we currently have, as a country, uh, and this is Ministry of Health, we currently have a national HMIS uh, system that captures aggregate information. Um, from within the Ministry of Health, there are departments uh, that do some kind of parallel data collection and reporting um, at the national level. Uh, for the interests really that we'll be discussing. So uh, the National TB and Leprosy Program uh, is, is one of those kinds of departments that are unique and they're kind of, uh, they want the data in different ways. So they needed real-time integral and visual level data um, for purposes of reporting, uh, but also the ability to track patients progress along the continuum of care. Um, and this is really like real time, um, focusing on other areas like uh, transfers, appointments, uh, tracing contacts and treatment outcomes. TB is a very, very unique uh, and interesting disease. So um, this really necessitated uh, the implementation of this uh, instance. Um, lastly, quicker, better tailored response for, program, for the program to really respond to challenges uh, through data systems. Um, this this uh, project was uh, supported uh, through the National TB and Leprosy Program, uh, which is based in the Ministry of Health. Um, and of course, so many other partners are very interested in this data. So they've been part of the whole uh, process. The objectives uh, were to improve TB and leprosy treatment outcomes of individual patients uh, through one, case-based monitoring. Like I said also earlier, patient transfers um, across both accredited and non-accredited treatment units. Uh, but also improve surveillance uh, across uh, and of course for uh, decision makers to get access to, to data and, um, uh, and control the spread of uh, TB. We, we've gone through the normal process of uh, documentation uh, and having people participate in the, in the requirements collection process. And this really helped us to understand um, what is required um, for, for this instance to work. Because again, there was a contradiction between having this uh, case-based surveillance tool uh, alongside uh, existing um, electronic medical record systems. Remember, both uh, collecting individual patient data and um, so we had to draw a line there. So we had quite a long time of uh, discussion, picking data requirements and then documenting. 
Um, like Olaf has been presenting, ours was really a bit more of a combined approach uh, to have both tracker and aggregate in one system. Again, with the aim of um, being able to pull this data and send it to the national HMIS uh, that currently has aggregate. So the vision really was that for TB accredited and non-accredited sites, they would not have to manually fill in the TB summary report that goes to the HMIS on a quarterly basis. So we chose to have a tracker and aggregate uh, combined approach uh, so that once we have the tracker data, we're able to aggregate this and then send it to the HMIS uh, system. Um, uh, additionally, the other point really was that we needed to migrate some data from existing um, uh, parallel system. One of those national TB uh, best system was collecting data on MDR TB. MDR is multi drug resistant TB. Um, so we needed, once there was this national grid system, we needed to pull all its data uh, that had been reported in that system and bring it uh, in one central reporting uh, platform. Uh, then there was also the issue of uh, integration uh, where we needed to have modules um, within uh, this surveillance system that would pull data from other existing system that facilities like lab, um, like other EMRs and so on. And then of, of course overall uh, support um, uh, tra training and capacity building of different teams. Um, so the data model was really more of a simple one. Um, for TB, we focused on enrollment, treatment, lab, adverse events, and then treatment outcomes. So that's really generally, I think, uh, I won't go into the details of that. Um, on the integration and linkage side, um, we, you, you notice uh, that uh, this uh, basically brings together um, uh, different data. So I talked about the MDR instance that had legacy data. Um, on this side, we have the uh, Ministry of Health DHIS2 or HMIS. Um, but from the facility side, we had we have different um, EMRs that uh, have currently been reporting data uh, in a parallel way. And we have lab systems, um, we have uh, contact tracing systems, and then we had uh, direct data entry uh, based on the facility registers, uh, patient cards, and so on. But also uh, data reported using uh, uh, mobile applications uh, through SMS notifications um, to clients and, and other providers. And then, of course, the analysis. So it was important uh, that we consider a more of a flexible approach that could address um, bringing together uh, the needs, uh, both at the facility, uh, the district, and also at the national level. Um, so on the specific on the linkage part and within the system, we uh, looked, of course, we had the, the, the programs designed in the tracker capture data. Um, and like I said, we have the, the aggregate side, which had both the um, quarterly um, aggregate report from the HMIS and also another monthly aggregate report uh, also from the HMIS. So uh, once we receive data from on the tracker side, we build uh, program indicators um, to pull data uh, through an, a web API and then populate this data on the aggregate side. Um, again, so here, 
it's, it's important because there's a lot of uh, mapping uh, required. So we had to design the program indicators uh, to look exactly similar uh, with similar names as the data elements so that it's much, much easy when you are mapping um, the metadata. Then additionally, um, you, HISP Uganda uh, in the past has developed this data import wizard app, which was presented also in the 2019 conference, 2018. Um, that uh, allows um, program indicator to data set mapping and then uh, supports uh, automated um, import and uh, export of data uh, through um, the web API. Yeah, so the uh, program indicators again are uh, saved uh, automatically and data is, is uploaded and the mapping can be you know, kept within. I will, I will quickly give uh, some screenshots on, on how this works. Um, the payload is uh, also downloaded for verification. Again, where mapping is very is in, involved, you need to make sure that the, pro, the, the program indicators are sending the, 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 the correct data to the correct uh, data element. So we had a lot of verification to, to make sure that um, every every field um, on the aggregate side uh, is, is linked to the correct program indicator. And this was of course a bit manual, but very helpful. Um, uh, still on the linkages, um, yeah, we, we, we've had to put together um, uh, and develop um, a web service uh, to support uh, receiving uh, uh, data from other uh, EMRs. Uh, like I mentioned, we have some system uh, developed based on open MRS, and we have also a lab uh, system. There's another one called Clinic Master, and all these are within the facilities that uh, we are implementing the system. So we've developed again a web service um, capable of receiving a fire message, um, converting it um, into DHIS uh, specific format, and then uh, receive the data on the on the tracker side. Uh, so this 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 again is one of the key components that probably uh, we'll discuss an, another time. On the data migration, um, like I mentioned, there was a, a system uh, that was pulling and picking data on uh, uh, drug resistant TB and uh, this system, uh, we use the data import wizard to link um, directly and then uh, import the data automatically into, into the tracker. So uh, some quick lessons learned, uh, linking data requires creating mapping program indicators uh, to data elements. And this is uh, one of the options, of course, we chose. Uh, all I've mentioned, there are quite many others, including using the predictors, but we felt this was uh, quite straightforward and much easy to, to manage. Um, uh, of course, the, 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 it means that uh, if you have a matrix that has uh, age and sex disaggregations, uh, you have to sort of create a program indicator for each, for each of the fields um, that you want to push uh, data to. Um, that we did minimize on, on that manual work uh, you, by use of a spreadsheet and then creating the program indicators, um, uh, sort of using the spreadsheet to to, to pull through and then manage the, the different uh, categories of, of, of the data elements. Um, we've also uh, noticed that sometimes uh, there's been some data mismatch um, where by when you run a line list uh, in the uh, report, in the event report, um, and you are likely going to get a different figure uh, on the aggregate side. 
so we we still trying to find out what's happening. Uh, but in most cases, it's related to analytics uh, because our analytics do not run um, uh, uh, every hour. Uh, so users will want to see their data on the aggregate side. Um, when they do that, that's uh, sometimes it does uh, create some data mismatch because you have tracker data and and then you have uh, analytics on the aggregate side. Um, uh, we have also seen that uh, the linkage of uh, tracker to aggregate uh, minimizes uh, the duplication of efforts. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, we, we are pushing the aggregate uh, report to the HMIS, at least for facilities that are able to report. They don't have to, again, manually go and enter this uh, report in the national HMIS system. Um, I also made a comment earlier on, the, on this uh, fourth point that most users are more comfortable with the uh, aggregate analytic features. And this is because, uh, of course, they have been using DHIS2 for aggregate reporting. And so when you bring the tracker side, um, there are a, a few more steps to, to get a report. And, and so it becomes uh, a bit uh, tricky. And so you, you won't uh, really uh, get so many people using um, like uh, event reports to do the analysis or even the event visualizer. Um, at least for what we have seen in the facilities that we have been supporting. Um, and to be precise, we have about 1,700 facilities in the country that are reporting on TB. Uh, people don't do reporting using the, the event report and event visualizer. They prefer to use uh, the pivot table the data visualizer and so on. So um, yeah, uh, again, the last point here is that metadata uh, has to be kept in sync always. I think uh, Olaf already mentioned this. Yes. So, <clears throat> so I wanted to quickly do uh, a small short uh, demo. So this is the data entry layout. We have four programs. Um, Yeah, um, so for the, for the application that we've been using to, to do the, the import um, from program indicators to, to the report, you can see here um, that we normally upload directly. So we'll specify the URL, uh, put the, um, the username and password. And then here we will have to specify um, that we are moving data from um, indicators to a data set. And we can have um, data moved for different uh, um, options where we can move indicators to, in, to data sets. We can do data elements to data set. But in this case, we also use program indicators to, to data set. So once you select that option, um, we are able to sort of, the app pulls both um, data uh, on, um, on organization, on, on, on OP init, for example, and it will automatically map um, uh, the facilities. Technically, these are the same uh, OG units in the same system, so we wouldn't expect to find uh, anything that's not uh, uh, mapped. Uh, but if it was from another system, you would have um, an option to see what is mapped versus what is unmapped. And what's not uh, mapped will basically uh, list. And we are moving, again, here we'll be moving data at facility level. So um, each facility should be able to, to map uh, to one another. Uh, the second screenshot, again, shows the uh, the program indicators and the data elements. So here on this side, where we have the source, you find that these are the, uh, the actual uh, program indicators we've created. And in the destination, 
we have the data elements uh, on the aggregate side. So normally uh, the reason we did that was for the app to automatically pick and match uh, each, uh, each program indicator with the data element, um, either by ID, code, name, um, or we can even uh, uh, match them using a manual approach. Uh, if it, there's anywhere where it doesn't match, you can manually uh, search and then it will bring back a list of, uh, uh, bring back a list of the available options uh, on the data element side and we can pick those and map them. Um, lastly, we are able still also to map, uh, to pick the periods for which we want the data to move. Again, because our aggregate data set is quarterly, so the periods here will automatically show uh, on a quarterly basis. And then we can also determine the, determine the, the records that we want to push uh, per page. Um, ultimately, once data goes in, uh, once data has been pushed, we'll have, um, this is the national data set. And this is how it looks like. Uh, it will be populated and for each different cases and categories, uh, the data will be aggregated and, and pushed in uh, automatically. I think um, that's mostly uh, what I wanted to share on this uh, uh, over uh, and uh, probably we can have some Q&A uh, on this. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. That's uh, really interesting. We had at least one question uh, from the chat about the name of the app. Can you remind us? Thank you so much. The so the, the one I'm actually showing is called um, we, we we call it a wizard, but it's part of the data import um, uh, the data import uh, wizard, which you can actually find, uh, sorry, let me see, where are we? Oh, if you go to the uh, apps, and you look for data import wizard, you should be able to find. So this is the app. Um, are you still able to see my screen? Yes. So this is, yeah, yeah, so this is the app. Uh, it's developed by his Uganda. You will find it there. You can take the latest version and it should be able to, to do most of this. Um, uh, the current stable version supports 2.9 uh, and above. Great. 